Let me say first on behalf of my wife, who is quite simply the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> uh, and that's subjective. <laughs> How deeply happy we've been to spend this weekend with this rather remarkable congregation and this remarkable gathering of visitors from, I can't remember how many states. Uh, you've enriched our lives enormously. We find it hard to believe that such a community of faith in Springfield, Missouri as this one. <laughs> but we rejoice in that. And your hospitality and graciousness has been overwhelming. And the Yankees even beat the Red Sox last night, <laughs> six to four. So we're solidly in fourth place. <laughs> what I'm going to do this morning may turn out to be a disaster, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to try to say everything I wanted to say in an hour, in less than an hour. I'm going to try to sum up the Gospel of John in a relevant way so that you can have something sort of neat and wrapped up to take home with you. And I'm going to focus on the crucifixion. It's interesting to me that the climax of John's gospel is not the resurrection of Jesus. It is not the ascension. It is not the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps John, following a technique that would be made famous by William Shakespeare, decided to make his climax not his conclusion. It is the crucifixion that is the climax of John's gospel. Shakespeare would always watch the tensions in his play develop in Acts 1 and 2, bring the climax in Act 3, and let the climax work itself out in Acts 4 and 5. So like Shakespeare, John's gospel climaxes before it concludes. John has Jesus called the crucifixion, quote, my hour, unquote. My hour is the thing for which his whole life is directed. His hour is the moment when his purpose and his meaning will be revealed. The cross for Jesus is not a tragedy, for John is not a tragedy. It's a triumph. The cross is not an instrument of execution. It's a throne from which Jesus reigns. That is quite different from the way the crucifixion is treated in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, the three earlier gospels. So we listen to what John's Jesus says about the cross to have this point of view confirmed when I am lifted up, says John's Jesus, and that means on the cross, when I am lifted up, that's the moment when I will draw all people to myself. When I am lifted up, that's when people will know who God is. The way he says it is that's when they will know I am, which is the name of God in the book of Exodus. John's entire gospel builds toward this moment, my hour. It cannot be forced. In the story of the waters of Jewish purification being turned into the wine of the Christian Eucharist in chapter 2, Jesus rebukes his mother for trying to force him to engage his hour before the time is right. Woman, what have I done to do with you? My hour has not come, he says. In the seventh chapter of John's Gospel, it is Jesus' brothers who try to force his carefully crafted time schedule. His brothers say to him, if you really are the Messiah, go up to Jerusalem for this festival, this feast. It was the harvest festival of the Jews called Sukkot. And show yourself. Jesus responds once again, rebuking these members of his own family. 
My time, my hour has not yet come. And then in the 12th chapter, the one we just read for our lesson, which in the fourth gospel is the pivotal transition chapter that stands between the book of signs and the discussion of the last week in Jesus' life. There Jesus announces, my hour has come, the hour has come for me to be glorified. And what was the context of that announcement? Some Greek citizens had come to Philip and Andrew saying to them, sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip and Andrew bring these Greeks, these unclean, uncircumcised, non-kosher eating, non-Torah studying, and non-Torah observing Gentiles, they bring these Gentiles to Jesus. And in that moment, the great divide in the Jewish world between the clean and the unclean between the Jew and the Gentile has been transcended. And that is the signal in John's gospel when Jesus says, by being lifted up, I will draw all people beyond their separated boundaries so that they can stand together. I will bring people beyond every human division to the place where they find unity in me and in one another. So John's gospel drives relentlessly toward this climax. The cross for John is the moment when God is revealed in the life of Jesus. And in that revelation is also revealed the unity of all humanity. Now the cross for John is not about saving sinners. It is not about redeeming the fallen. It is not about rescuing the lost. It is about calling people into a new dimension of what it means to be human. It's about expanding life, not overcoming sin. There is a big difference. John is not into atonement theology. It is not about Jesus dying for our sins. It's about Jesus' call and indeed Jesus' empowerment to invite each of us into an abundant life that we could not possibly have experienced without him. John has Jesus even announce his purpose. I have come that you might have life, he says, not to make you religious. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. When this gospel reaches its conclusion, before the epilogue is added, the author says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing you might have life in his name. Now to call Jesus the Son of God does not mean that you're quoting fourth century creeds about incarnation or the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. What it means to say that Jesus is the Son of God in this Jewish frame of reference is that you might believe that Jesus, in Jesus, the human can indeed flow into the divine that God and human life can be one, that they can be related to each other as the branches are related to the vine. John's gospel is about bringing us into mystical oneness with God and with each other. It's about the human and the divine coming together, not acting as if they are separate categories so that the human Jesus can be made to say in the fourth gospel, the Father and I are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And that's why John calls Jesus over and over again by God's name. The affirmation is that the life of God 
is only seen in the life of the human. So John alone has Jesus say what we call the I am sayings. They don't appear in any other gospel. Jesus clearly never spoke these words. But these words are interpreted as part of the portrait that John is drawing for Jesus. So John's Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am that which satisfies the deepest hunger in the human soul for wholeness. I am the living water. I satisfy humanity's deepest thirst to be itself. I am the vine in which every branch belongs and all flow together. I am the gate, I am the door through which humans enter the divine and through which the divine enters the human. I am the resurrection. I am the source of life. I am the way to God. I am the life that brings the human and the divine together. So John's gospel spells out this theme it begins by asserting that there is a oneness between the human and the divine. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It does not start with the picture of human beings as fallen sinners, separated by sin from God, and waiting in passive resignation for God to rescue, save, or redeem. That is not the language of the fourth gospel. Human beings for John are not fallen sinners. They're incomplete human beings. They don't need to be rescued. They need to be empowered to be all that they are capable of being. So we look again at the whole Johannine narrative to see this theme playing out over and over and over again. In chapter 3, Jesus calls Nicodemus to leave his world of insecurity and incompleteness and to step across a boundary into a new consciousness, a new understanding of what it means to be human. But Nicodemus, who comes to Jesus only by night, cannot ever take this step. In chapter 4, Jesus confronts the Samaritan woman by the well. And the differences between the Jews and the Samaritans are transcended. This woman, this Samaritan woman, wants to know what's the proper way to worship in Mount Gerizim, as the Samaritans say, or in the temple in Jerusalem. As the Jews say, settle this dispute for us. And Jesus says in response, you don't understand who God is. Neither place is the ultimate place of worship. For God is spirit and God permeates all things. If you worship God, you must worship in spirit and in truth. It is universal peacemaking. It is spirit permeating all that is. It is declaring all life to be holy and all human barriers to be relative, not ultimate. Those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. Then in chapter 5, Jesus heals the, Samar the Gentile official son and he heals this Gentile at a distance. He's not even present with this Gentile. No distance between the Jew and the Gentile can ever stand against the love of God. It's a story of human oneness. Still in chapter 5, Jesus heals a man who is said to have been crippled for 38 years. That's longer than the life expectancy of anyone in the first century. This is a lifetime cripple. But he's saying that there is no condition of human brokenness 
that ultimately can resist the love of God. That's a very different message from what most people think when they read that story. Then in chapter 6, the multitudes are fed with limited resources. Five loaves and two fish. And they gather up abundant fragments when all have eaten their fill. It's not a literal story. But it's a story that says that there is no human hunger that can ever go unsatisfied. If you live inside the meaning of God and humanity. And then Jesus walks on water, we are told. And that story proclaims that all of nature's limits are transcended inside the love of God. In chapter 9, Jesus gives sight to one who was born blind. No human blindness can stand before the ultimate revelation of God. And finally, in chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus four days dead from the grave, proclaiming that no limitation on our humanity, not even death and finitude, can finally separate any of us from oneness with God. The miracles of the earlier Christian tradition have been turned by John into being signs, signs of what it means to be human, what it means to allow our humanity to step from self-consciousness into universal consciousness, from individualism into a community that includes everyone into the infinity of the divine, into mystical union with all that is. John's gospel, as I've suggested in the title, represents tales of a Jewish mystic. That is John's, under that is John's understanding of the God that he is convinced he has encountered in some remarkable way in the life of the human Jesus of Nazareth. Then as he moves into the last week of Jesus' life, following the proclamation that my hour has come when Jew and Gentile come together, he begins to paint the portrait of how the God who is lived in and revealed through Jesus of Nazareth is open to all of us. It is not through a supernatural birth that God is seen as present in Jesus. John omits the virgin birth totally from his gospel. It is not through the power to do supernatural miracles, which John has turned into signs that point beyond themselves. It comes when the human person steps beyond the biological drive that dominates every one of us for our own survival. It is because we are survival-oriented creatures like all of nature. It's in our biology, it's in our genes. It's because we are biological people that survival has been made the highest goal of our existence. That's true of every living thing, every plant, every insect, every animal. We're all survival-oriented people. And when self-conscious human beings recognize that they are driven more than anything else by their own desire to survive, that's when they realize that self-centeredness is a part of our humanity. It's not a fall. It's a part of what we are. Without it, we would never have climbed through our evolutionary history to be the top of the food chain. We are the winners in the survival battle with nature. But when there are no more enemies to conquer that stand between us and our survival, then we almost inevitably turn upon one another and ultimately upon ourselves. And that's what our ancient forebears saw as the original sin of our humanity. 
They thought it was related to our doing. The myth said it was because we disobeyed God's word and ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. But it is part of our very nature. It's in our biology. It's part of what it means to be alive. It's part of what it means to be human. And ultimately, we have to step beyond our survival mentality to experience the ultimate meaning of humanity. And that is the portrait of Jesus that John draws, a human life that stepped beyond the survival orientation of human biology. Jesus is free to die because he has been freed to live. When he was bet betrayed according to the gospel tradition, he did not respond by feeling hurt or by checking off another enemy on his list. When he was betrayed, he responded by loving the betrayer. That's a life gift, not a survival gift. When he was denied, he responded by loving the denier. When he was forsaken, he responded by loving those who had forsaken him. When he was abused, he responded by loving his abusers. And when he was killed, he responded by loving his killers. That is the portrait of a life that has transcended the survival mentality that marks human beings. That is why they saw something beyond the human in him. He was saying that in his life, there is nothing that would separate him from the love of God. He is saying to you and to me, that in our lives, there is nothing we can do and there is nothing we can be that will ever separate us from the love of God. That's what the gospel is all about. All human limits, all human fears, all human inadequacies, all human mistakes, all human guilt can be transcended. John's Jesus does not die for our sins, as if someone has to be punished. He dies to reveal a humanity that is so full and so free and so complete that he can give his life away. And that is why the cross for John is the moment of the ultimate revelation of the meaning of God. The moment when God is revealed as the ultimate dimension of our human life. So come out of religion's fear for a moment. Step apart from religion's imposed guilt. Step away from all of those messages of our sinfulness and our inadequacy with which Christian churches have pummeled humanity through the centuries. And see the faith that Jesus revealed to be the power to bind together that which had been broken or separated. The power to overcome inadequacies. The power to heal the hurts in every human being. And discover the power of self-giving that is so deep that inside this ability to give your life away, Jews and Samaritans can come together. Jews and Gentiles can come together. And Jews and Christians discover that they are one. And in that moment, all the separating human boundaries begin to fall around us. The boundary that separates the male from the female. The gay, lesbian, transgender, and bisexual person from the majority heterosexual person. The boundaries fall between Catholic and Protestant, between Sunni and Shia, between Muslim and Hindu, 
between black, white, and Asian, even between Democrats and Republicans, between communist and capitalist, between God and all of humanity. Jesus is about expanding human life until all divisions, which are part of our insecurity, fall away. And then we recognize that the human can flow into the divine. And that is what Jesus is all about. That is also, I might add, the only task worthy of the Christian church. Our task is not to defend our truth against all comers or to burn at the stake those who might disagree with our version of truth. Our task is not to convert the heathen or even to save the sinners from original sin or from the fires of hell. Those are all part of our behavior controlling mechanisms. Our task is to expand the humanity in every one of us until we can step beyond our boundaries into a universal sense of what it means to be human, until we can step into what we understand to be the meaning of the divine. And that is what the Jesus of the fourth gospel is all about. And that is why the Jesus of the fourth gospel defines his purpose so powerfully in chapter 10. I have not come to make you religious. I have not come to make you moral or righteous. I have not come that you might have true faith so that you can look down upon others who are so inadequate to your own understanding of God. No, he says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. That's what the gospel is all about. And the mission of the church is simply to give life, to expand life, to stop denigrating another human being because they are different, but to be the agents of wholeness in the midst of our world. You see, for the Jesus movement, God is not a noun that we have to define. God is a verb that we have to live. And that's what John's gospel is all about. Amen. You have been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.